So he's actually a Stanford, uh, he did his PhD in the physics department here. Um, so he's kind of state where, where a physics PhD. <laughs> um, after that, he went to Bell Labs, uh, where he worked on photonics and space things. Um, uh, he then he then got a faculty position at Duke, where he's been ever since. Uh, and I don't know exactly when it happened, but at some point uh, he kind of you know got uh, you know seduced by quantum. Uh, so we're all very lucky for that. Um, uh, he didn't go to the dark side like you know where where I live, but, but he still got light, you know. But um, and, and, uh, and I, think, I think him getting interested in that has really been. Uh, you know, kind of a profound thing for the whole field because I think, you know, more than almost anybody else, I think he's really kind of brought, uh, you know, like he had to, he has his background in physics, but also was in the, actually the electrical engineering department at Duke. And so he really brought this kind of idea of like, how do you engineer a system, you know, to make it from something that, you know, can kind of work with grad students constantly tweaking it and, and you know fixing it slightly faster than the break um, uh, to you know something that's both you know engineered like kind of chip scale like you know in, in, in kind of a, um, a, you know semiconductor engineering way but also in terms of like you know the optics and all the, all the other aspects um, you know right now there's, um, he's also the co-founder of ING which is uh, First public uh, quantum computing companies that uh, and you know and, and uh, can actually uh, go on the cloud and actually access the cloud. I think he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, you know the ions themselves and how they work. And, uh, thank you. All right, th thank you, David, for hosting, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I think I, I got a window of quantum actually very early on when I was here as a graduate student. I worked on quantum optics. I uh, did my PhD with uh, Professor Yoshi Yamamoto, who's, who's retired now. I was one of his very first students. Um, and I, I started here the, the year at Mark and uh, Charlie Mark became first faculty members in 1992. <laughs> so I spent a little bit of time uh, in Varian building in my first year. Um, but this room wasn't here. We used to have this thing called Physics Tank, which is a circular building of big lecture halls. Uh, so it's nice to be uh, to be back, as always. And I, and um, after joining Yoshi's group, I spent most of my um, graduate life in Ginston Lab, the old Ginston Lab, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. Um, so it's really nice to see this part of the campus uh, having completely uh, revitalized around uh, science and engineering. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, I, I'm, um, I'm visiting for a few days, and tomorrow uh, in the engineering school, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, this, this technology as a, as a computer. Um, but uh, given this is more of a, a, a science community, um, I'm going to tell you some uh, realization, um, more recent realization um, about qubits and their errors, and they're not the same. Um, and uh, the convey some of my dogma about why uh, atomic systems make a fantastic uh, substrate for quantum computers. Um, so we'll be a lot more about uh, physics and, uh, and, and, and science technology uh, rather than applications. All right, so this work, uh, a lot of this work is, is a, a, a huge collaboration. It, it's, uh, it can be done by one person or even one group. Uh, so I'm uh, very grateful for many years of funding support from various government agencies. Uh, and also, um, I'll, I'll come up with a long list of collaborators that I've been working with uh, over the last couple of decades uh, working on this project. Um, this is the outline. Um, I want to really kind of evangelize why craft ions are great. Actually, uh, any any atomic systems that have a hyperfine ground state. Um, I wasn't. I actually started my career here as a semiconductor physics um, randolition producer, and a lot of the the challenges that uh, uh, solid state qubits uh, face, I've, I've actually lived through that. Although we weren't necessarily working on qubits, but a lot of the tools. Um, uh, I only got introduced to, to these prep diet qubits as I was moving to Duke about 20 years ago. Um, and I feel, saw an opportunity for bringing a lot of this technology uh, in cryogenics and things like that to the atomic physics world. And that has been a wonderful journey. 
Um, and then um, I'm gonna give you a very brief uh, view of what programmable quantum computers are and why um, the architecture that we chose um, have uh, have a very uh, interesting uh, opportunities when it comes to trying to do computing with it. Um, and then um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about errors. Um, and I think you know, error correction and fault tolerance and, and um, these things are, are very big topics. Um, but by diving deep into it, I think there's a lot more than just a simple there are errors and we have to deploy error correction to fix it. I think there is um, quite a bit of uh, nuance to it. I'd like to see. Um, and over the last seven years, um, I've been running this DARPA uh, funded logical qubits program uh, based on DARPA. There are lots of very interesting insights that came through it, uh, which I think has the big implications, uh, both in the science side, but also on the technology side. Um, I will give you a little bit of uh, uh, you know, fun progress that we've made on uh, making things smaller and more compact and more reliable optic twice. Um, and then uh, maybe some of the directions that the research community can go. All right, so let's start with a very pro provocative question. Um, if you're looking for a perfect human, what does a perfect human uh, look like? And you know, this is uh, for any scientists uh, who are trained to be uh, rigorous and skeptical, anytime you say perfect, um, it's it's a problem, right? Because <laughs> there's nothing perfect in this world. Um, but uh, I'd like to actually still try to pose this question. And uh, you know, uh, a qubit is basically um, a two-level quantum system um, that you can manipulate, and and therefore um, yeah. you should be able to manipulate the full uh, quantum state of these two levels, which ideally is described by this block sphere. Okay? Block sphere means um, you know there is the north pole and the south pole, which represent zero and one state. The relative population between these two is measured by this angle theta, and then the relative phase between the two is measured by this angle pi. Okay, and the question is: uh, so the definition of a perfect qubit, a limited definition, is here: is I'm going to store one qubit of information in this physical system. I'm going to hope it lasts forever. And okay? so that's if you can do that, if you can store one qubit of information and keep it forever. That's a pretty good uh, uh, quantum memory. Um, and that's what I would mean by perfect. So it doesn't mean that you can do perfect you know, computation with it. It's just that when you put an information in there, it's one qubit, that's gonna last forever. Um, if we borrow the language from NMR, uh, this means that there are two time constants. One, the PK time constant, where the population of between zero and one changes over time. Usually, if this is a high, you put a, 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 an excitation in here. Over time, it's gonna decay to the well. In that time scale, it's called Q1. Okay. The second is, uh, uh, and that's really uh, the time scale over which this theta changes spontaneously. The second is phi, which is a relative phase. I mean, that is actually now determined by the relative frequency between these two. If you know exactly what that frequency is, then you can keep the track of that phase forever. Okay. But if there is a frequency that fluctuates, then over time, you're going to end up uh, this time evolution of e to the i omega t is going to accumulate some phase noise. And over the time scale over which the first noise accumulates is called T2. Okay, so um, T1 is population decay, T2 is the phase decoherence. Um, so if you can make these two numbers to be very long, then I think you have a pretty good qubit. Um, so we're thinking about um, uh, an atomic system with a hyperfine interact. Hyperfine means the spin of the electron interact with the spin of the nucleus, and there is some energy separation due to that interaction. Um, and the simplest system that have a hyperfine ground state is a hydrogen atom. Um, and if you look at the spontaneous decay time for hydrogen atom between from this level to that level, um, that rate is estimated to be about three times 10 minus per second. And uh, when converted into time, it's about 11 million years. And that's pretty long, okay? Um, and for hydrogen, this is about the 1.2 gigahertz separation. And the uh, and this time actually uh, is dependent on the third power of the frequency. Um, so the hyperfine frequencies of qubits that we use in terbium or barium, which is about 10 gigahertz, going to be about, 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 a, about a thousand times shorter. Okay, so it will be about a thousand years. Okay, so, oh, 10,000. So it's pretty long. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody has bothered to measure it. Um, I, I don't think anybody has patience to wait that long. Um, but in practice, of course, that's that's in principle. In practice, it's limited by collisions. So if you can get the really good vacuum so that this qubit doesn't collide with background molecules, um, then this T1 can be made really, really long. Okay, so not limited by fundamentals uh, for a long time, it's limited by technology of how good of a vacuum uh, you can get. 
The second uh, is the thing, uh, which is that e to the i omega t, if you know the frequency difference between these two levels extremely well, then you can actually have a, a keep track of this phase, uh, phase forever. But in any real physical system, there is some fluctuation in that frequency. And that accumulates an undetermined uh, phase accumulation over time. Um, but um, if you pick a hyperfine ground state of cesium um, as, um, as a reference, then that frequency of 9.19631770 hertz is actually exact. There is no error in it, because that's how we define one second. <laughs> okay, so that's the absolute reference. So if you pick the high, uh, cesium hyperfine ground state, um, then uh, by definition, your qubit doesn't need to hear. Um, you're now limited by things like magnetic field nodes or your ability to lock your classical clock that you use to keep you count time to this absolute reference series. Okay, so again, it becomes a technology problem rather than a prison. Okay, um, so um, sure enough, uh, the T2 in some of these systems have been extended to 90 minutes. That means we could set our qubit to be coherent in the beginning of this lecture, and by the time we're all done, the qubit will still be coherent, right? And that, that's kind of, um, and, and all of that's just purely limited by technology rather than technology. All right, so what that means is this hyperfine ground state, as long as we define second based on hyperfine splitting of an atom, which is which is the current SI standard, um, it's it's hard to get any better than this. Okay, uh, so it's a really good choice. Um, now, but it doesn't mean that you can do perfect quantum computation, right? I'm, I'm not trying to advocate for that. So it also means that all errors actually originate from controlling this qubit. And that's all in, in many cases. Now, of course, once you go to the controlling the qubit, then depending on how you do it, some fundamental limits, how the qubit actually starts to slip in. Uh, but in many cases, practically today, we are limited by, again, technology and how well we can make controls. Uh, so um, I think the, the beauty of this physical system is uh, making better quantum computers is purely an engineering and, and technology challenge. Um, okay, so so that I think is is what makes this a, a really appealing uh, approach for for me because we're not fighting in physics; we're really trying trying to come up with better ways to control these systems. So um, actually, uh, I think there was a slight change in my order. Let me actually go and. Uh, Put this slide up. So um, if, when you want to do a good quantum computation, you have to initial, be able to initialize the state. You have to be able to you know, uh, do arbitrary quantum computation of single qubit and two qubit gates, and hopefully multi qubit gates. And then you have to be able to read out the quantum states uh, very reliably. Um, and of course, when you do any of these operations, we now start to have some errors that, that sit in. Um, in the qubit initialization, um, you know, the fundamental errors here is about 10 to minus 6 uh, in the qubit that we're using, this is terbium hyperfine qubits. Um, and this is purely limited by what's called an off-resonance scatter. Um, okay, so just the energy level splitting so that is determined, which is actually, again, pretty good. Qubit measurement, we, we do this by resonance resonance, and this is um, limited to about 10 to minus 2 or 10 to minus 4. Um, but again, people are starting to come up with other ways to uh, improve the detection fidelity. So that by no means is fundamental at this point. Um, but if you want to do it relatively straightforward way, uh, that's kind of the limit we're in. And again, all of these things are limited by your efficiency to collect the photons and detect them without background error and things like that. Uh, single qubit gates, uh, we can actually achieve 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 5 uh, single qubit gate errors. Um, these are, when you drive this by uh, uh, Raman transition, which is what we do, uh, they're limited by spontaneous emission, and therefore um, that, is, uh, that is actually starting to be a fundamental limit. But if you try to do this with microwave, you don't have that limit. You can actually do, do fundamentally a lot better than that. Um, again, the, the, the question is, you know, how good do you need to be for a specific targeted performance of the machines? Um, the practical limitation really comes from uh, the, the two qubit gate errors. Um, and uh, here, uh, what we do is, uh, depending on the internal atomic state, we push the atom in a different way. So if you're in one state, you push it up. If you're in the other state, you push it down. And that can actually induce uh, uh, state-dependent forces. And that is actually what media uh, mediates uh, the qubit gate. Uh, and here, because you are transferring this ideal hyperfine internal qubit into a motion of degree of freedom for, for a little bit, um, you are limited by uh, errors in that, uh, not only spontaneous emission, but also in that motion of occurrence. 
Um, and uh, making that function very, very stable is also, again, a technical challenge, not necessarily a fundamental challenge. So let me go back and, and give you a couple of examples of how uh, these uh, um, high fidelity two qubit gate stuff, because that uh, at a physical level seems to be the most challenging thing to do. So in order to um, think about encapsulating, you have these two atoms um, that are, and then the trap ions, we strip an electron from the uh, from the atom, and therefore these atoms are charged. And that's why they're called ions. Uh, but they're individual atoms, but they're charged atoms. And if you put them into a uh, potential created by that, that trap uh, that I showed you earlier, I'm not going to get into the technology of it, um, then you know they propel each other and they form this linear crystal. They're very easy. You can form this linear crystal. And because they have Coulomb interaction, if you shake one, the other won't shake. And that shaking motion is uh, quantized as well because that is a harmonic oscillator motion. It's a particle in a, uh, you know, in a, in a track. Um, and then what you do is we can actually create a state dependent force, meaning uh, depending on the external state, we can push the atoms in the opposite direction. And therefore, we excite these motional degrees of freedom in a superposition as well. You transfer that energy, uh, that qubit state into uh, a superposition of motion, and then you can catch it by, by the other atom. So there are um, a few mechanisms of doing that. Um, and I can tell you, um, you know, the, the, this is actually the very early work in 1995. Um, Sirach and Zoller came up with a scheme where you, you think about a chain of ions like this, right? It's a chain of ions, and I'm going to pick these two, and then I'm going to try to create an entanglement between them. So what you do is you first um, see if you can actually take this uh, atom in the ground state and excited state, and then transfer that kind of into the motion of your freedom for a while, um, and then see and if this guy can actually, uh, if, if the motional is ex motion is excited, then that atom actually does not accumulate a phase. But if the motion is not excited, you can accumulate a phase. And by doing that, you can add a, um, a, a, a phase shift of a deterministic uh, value based on the state of this atom. Okay? And that's how um, the original uh, Sarah Golder gate was proposed. Um, and my longtime colleague, Chris Monroe, in the same year, demonstrated the first experiment to actually um, show this. Okay, that was the, the first experimental demonstration of a quantum logic gate. Uh, it all started about, about 30 years ago. Now, um, this it turns out that this protocol, um, if you read it very carefully, is a lot more than just two qubit gates. You can actually generalize to multiple qubit gates in the sense that if you uh, have, for example, five ions in the chain that you pick, if you have a way to like individually address them, um, I can actually create a uh, flip on this final qubit based on the state of all of these. You can actually do it if all of these four are one, then I flip this. Um, if any one of them is zero, then I don't. It's a control, 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 not gate. So you can actually get, take this principle and generalize to that. Um, but there were some technical challenges of why that wasn't very easy to do experimentally. Um, so um, in about four years later, uh, Molmer and Sorensen, Klaus Molmer and Andrew Sorensen of uh, Denmark, uh, they came up with another uh, scheme uh, where you can actually do this two qubit gates even if um, the motion wasn't perfect, okay? Um, and in order to actually make this scheme work, you have to take the motional degree of freedom of the atom and cool it down into the fundamental ground state. You have to make sure that that motion is really cold. And then this, this gate works very well. If there's any noise in that motion, it actually perturbs the, the fidelity of the gate. Um, but this scheme actually makes you, um, the, the, the title says, uh, you know, even if the motion is in a thermal state, meaning there are some excitations, um, as long as that motional degree of freedom doesn't change over time, but they can do a very, very long game. Okay? And uh, this is kind of the scheme that's been um, heavily utilized in the community for the last uh, last 25 years, because you can actually create very high fidelity gates using that principle. Um, and then you know, there are many variations of that, that, that game um, that has, uh, that has um, uh, made its way. Um, so the variation of that Momo Sorensen gate uh, that we use uh, looks works Kind of in this way. Okay, so let's think about a uh, trapped iron qubit. It's a chain of ions, and they're all interacting. Um, they're all kind of pushing each other. And now I have created a uh, optical system where I can illuminate um, two of those ions in the chain. Okay, and um, by shining a laser beam, what I do is if the atom is in the uh, zero state, I put it. 
The other is in the ones that I put it down. So I say a file called the state dependent one. Okay. So if the atom is in a superposition of zero one, then I create a superposition of atoms being pushed up in that same path. Something that you know Mark does all the time building his uh, interferometers. Yeah, this is a very well, well known technique. Um, and if I do it to both, um, then uh, the distance, if you think about the distance between these two atoms, when they're both up, they move up together and the distance, relative distance doesn't change. When they're both down, they move down together and therefore the relative distance doesn't change. But if they're in up and down, then actually when you do this, the distance between the two atoms actually change. Okay? And what that means is there is going to be some change in the Coulomb interaction, which is given by E squared, over the distance. Okay, so if that delta, which is the, the amount that the atom is if pushed, uh, which is just a few nanometers, in this example about 10 nanometers, um, is, uh, is small compared to the relative distance, which is tens of microns, uh, then you can see that this interaction energy looks very much like a dipole dipole interaction. Okay, so you actually start from atoms, um, and based on the internal state, you create an effective dipole dipole interaction with a pretty large type of moment, about five to the bottom. Okay. So um, what happens is now, um, as I said, if it's up, up, or down, down, then there's no phase change. But when the energy is different, and if you wait for a while to bring it back, um, then you can accumulate a phase corresponding to that energy in the rate over time. But and if you can control um, that phase accumulation to be pi over two, um, then you can actually now uh, introduce a, 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 a conditional phase shift um, if the atoms are in the opposite direction. So the amount of accumulated phase is the same for this, for that, and therefore you have a state evolution that looks like this, okay? And that is actually a gate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a non-trivial two cubic gate. It's very negative to an ion chain like this, and we call it the Ising gate or the XX gate. Okay? It, it, it has the form, time evolution form, of e to the minus i times a sigma x sigma x for the two for the two um, spin operators, um, and then with that with an angle of psi. Okay, and we can actually get uh, pretty high fidelity gates uh, on this with uh, over time scales of just a few hundred times. So that's the basic principle. Um, now, of course, this is um, somewhat idealized. What actually happens is once you put an atom like this, you think about a guitar string and now you spot it. And this guitar string has many, many different modes, and all these modes get excited. Um, so in, in reality, in order to really achieve a high, high quality gain, you actually cannot just apply the force and then, and then bring it back. Because uh, if the atoms will start to like dance. What you do is you actually have to actually pull this thing in such a way that at the end of the gate, the, the, the chain comes to a complete still, so that the motional excitation um, gets completely de excited. And then now you can factor it out, and so there's no uh, leakage error into that into that motion. So you have to eliminate any remaining entanglement between the spin and the motion at the end of that. Case, okay. Um, and and you know that there's a lot of engineering uh, that goes in into designing those control pulses and so on. Um, but it, but uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it is actually not very hard to do. It is not very easy to do. <laughs> but it's actually. <laughs> Okay, so um, so where do we stand with this? Uh, this is actually a, a figure that was genetically put together by Dave Lucas at um, uh, at Oxford. Um, they're just looking at uh, based on these various types of qubits, uh, what is the uh, the fidelity of a two qubit gate um, time evolution uh, old evolution over time? <laughs> and you see that in the trap ions actually have been kind of leading the edge in terms of uh, doing better and better higher and higher fidelity gates. And I think superconducting qubits and neutral atom qubits have been um, um, have seen a lot of progress uh, in the meantime. Uh, but certainly, uh, trapped ions is where um, a lot of these early work uh, has been done. So um, I think this actually tells you some of the time scale over which uh, the fundamental or underlying progress uh, has been made uh, in this field. All right. So um, with that, um, I'd like to actually introduce a couple of very recent work um, we have done, uh, one from my group at Duke and the other one from Chris's group also at Duke. Um, and here, you know, this, um, uh, the question is, you know, can you actually start to, to engineer n-body interactions rather than the two cubic gates? Can you go to multi cubic gates? Um, and once you go to multi cubic gates, there are many, many different places where some multi cubic gates you can create. 
Uh, but here, um, you know, we actually went back to the original so-called forgotten uh, Sirac solar array um, and see if we can actually create control, 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 control objects right? in, in, a, in a real physical system. Um, and the reason that they um, they abandoned this, the community abandoned this in, in the previous years, um, has a few um, few real challenges. One is that you know this is the qubit that is extremely stable, but uh, the uh, Sirac Dolo gate requires access to one other level, an auxiliary level, um, and in the type of IQ for Eternity, we actually have these levels, but they are not very stable. These are Zeeman levels. If there's a magnetic field noise, this, this thing moves around. You actually have to store qubit in here for a little bit, and therefore, um, uh, you know, that impacts the fidelity. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then also, I, I mentioned that all of these most of modes have to be pulled out to the ground state and then kept keep, and tend to be kept there. So, a couple of things we've done. First thing is, uh, you know, we, we have to create uh, a very brute force new metal shield around our, our, our experiment. Um, so the coherence time of these states are typically about a second without doing much. This was in, in a millisecond frame. We were able to increase the coherence time of these demon levels by about a factor two. So we actually have a fraction of a second, uh, almost as good of a Zeeman level as the type of prime level. So that allowed you to you know, store qubits in that state without uh, it actually degrading very quickly. So that's one thing that we did. The other thing is uh, this, this motion of modes. Um, you know, when you when you um, pull the atom down, at the point it down to the ground state, any kind of electrical noise actually will, will continue to keep it. That, that's called the anomalous seating, which has been an issue uh, for the for the ion traffic in a while. I mean, that was a, a big issue when we focused the ions. But in, in a funny way, if you go to the long chain of ions, um, you have this center of mass mode where all the ions go together, and that actually heats up. And we have to deal with it. But there's also all of these like higher spatial frequency modes uh, where the ions are moving in opposite directions. I mean, there, in order to heat up those modes, you have to have a noise that has a spatial profile that is very, very high spatial frequency. And, and just those things just don't exist. So if you look at these other modes that have very high spatial frequencies, you can pull it down the ground state and they'll stay there for a long, long time, many seconds. Right? The heating rates there is really low. So it turns out that if you go to long chains, um, you actually gain a lot of these modes that are really nice to work. Okay, we actually avoid the center of mass mode, which is the easiest mode that I can think of, but well, we work with all these other modes. And that allows us to actually start realizing the state with a, with a reasonably high fidelity. So you know, we, we've actually done uh, control, control, not, control, 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 not. We only had five people, so that's, uh, that, that's how far we have gone. And by the time you get to these uh, very high um, high number of qubits, the, the characterization of those gates really, really take good. The traditional um, kind of uh, 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 tomography techniques really pull up here. Um, so it's, it's really hard to characterize. And that is a challenge. Um, but I think we're starting to think about the more creative ways. Um, to characterize the quality. And if you look at this population, um, you can see that there are very systematic patterns by which these errors go up, which means that we still have some, some systematic error control that is limiting the performance. So there's a lot of room to uh, make these gates uh, more, more higher quality. Um, but if you look at some of these very standard uh, bases, um, you know, they, their, their fidelity for this very large number of qubits are actually you know, it doesn't seem to be that bad. So, uh, so that, that's actually another direction. It turns out that when you're running certain algorithms like rover algorithms or error correction, um, these types of uh, high um, end body qubits uh, turn out to be, be pretty interesting and useful. Um, this is actually work from uh, Prince's lab. Um, the way we actually think about this, uh, uh, this XX gate or writing gates <coughs> is, uh, you know, I, I made this very simple assertion that, you know, it's really kind of the change of the tool in our but at the end of the day, what we're doing is instead of uh, really hitting the, the atoms to get excited, we actually excite this motion you know, in, a, in an operating way. So instead of like hitting the right, we actually tune in a little bit. Um, and then uh, we can actually start to control this uh, motion of excitation in a very coherent way. Um, and in, this is actually the, the uh, X and P, the, the uh, phase-based description of this motion of freedom. Um, and you can actually um, 
describe this as displacement operators in the in the X and Y uh, X and T plane. Okay. Now, if you familiar with quantum optics, um, there uh, is displacement operators are used for coherent states, which is basically the underlying ground state of a uh, harmonic oscillator. The classical ground state of a harmonic oscillator um, is is this coherent state. Okay. So now this formalism is very well known for any harmonic oscillator like photon, but also they apply to the phonons, uh, this phonons, the motion vibrational states. So here, what you do is, uh, you know, in order to do a gauge, uh, you actually push this uh, this this motion through some uh, phase space, and then you bring it back to the original place, so that the motion uh, gets excited. But at the end of that process, it comes exactly to where it started. Okay, so so that's that's where this is. You go around the loop. And the amount of area that's enclosed in that loop is that phase, e to the i phi phase. Okay. Um, so if you do it this displacement, um, we, in, in the real experiment, we do this in a more continuous way. We can think of it as like four discrete uh, kicks one kick, two kick, three kick, and then four kick. Close the loop. Um, and that actually encloses this area of AD. It turns out that if you, uh, instead of doing this uh, displacement operator, um, if you can actually introduce emotional squeezing, and, and this is um, it, it's the same kind of uh, operation, but there's some nonlinear environment. So instead of just doing a displacement, we're actually squeezing at, at the same time. If you have to replace these displacements with a bit of a squeezing operator, um, then it turns out um, that you can actually create um, a very different type of uh, phase. Where this section now uh, depends on the amount of squeezing that you do. Okay. Um, and it turns out that when you do this, uh, you don't need a whole lot of uh, squeezing, but when you do this, then uh, you actually create this uh, this higher order entanglement that's shown up there. Instead of x1, x2, just over two qubits, now you can do x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, or five qubits. Okay. Um, and that, that's a that's a very um, very neat uh, mathematical trick, but uh, they've actually now um, demonstrated this in the lab. Um, and, and, and that will uh, show that kind of a multi-qubit um, XX operators is, is actually exactly what you're measuring with your quantum error correct. So so this kind of uh, scheme can be extremely uh, extremely helpful uh, in that in that in that regard. All right, so um, and, and this actually shows um, like a three qubit uh, incumbent. Um, you can see that um, you know this period of oscillation because now they're all entangled into a uh, a GLT like space. The period is not two pi, but it's two pi divided by two. And then uh, they they've done it for four qubits and, and so on. So um, it looks like uh, we can actually in in trapped ion systems just by being clever about the interaction. You can actually start to create uh, multi cubic gates um, that start to deviate from just the two cubic gate model. Um, and utilizing some of these architecture can be uh, very helpful in implementing certain, um, uh, executing certain algorithms in the future. All right, so uh, what I've shown you is kind of the basic physical principles of why ions are interesting, how do you run gates, how do you actually create some very novel multi cubic gates, uh, how flexible of a system this provides. Um, and then, you know, the state of the art um, is kind of now we've taken some of these early demonstrations of uh, laboratory prototypes. Um, and then uh, Chris and I created this company, IQ, in 2015. Uh, I can't believe it was almost nine years ago that we did that. Um, and then, you know, we took the, the basic principles and started to see if we can build computers that are more reliable, that can, you know, um, run jobs 24 7. Um, and the very high level schematic of this is how we control it. Is we, we start from a single laser that we split, in, and then we uh, align each of these laser beams onto a chain of atoms. Um, and then, if you actually have a, um, in order to start, you actually try this laser beam and do the optical pumping, bring all of those qubits into the zero state. Um, and then, as a function of this gate, uh, this circuit, if you have two qubit gates, so pairs of two qubit gates and single qubit gates, all you have to do is just program these lasers to come on and off. Okay? Um, and then you can actually execute uh, uh, all of these, uh, any given circuit. Um, and although you feel like uh, you know, these ions in a linear chain, because the motion is all collective, you can actually pick arbitrary pairs of qubits and run two qubit gates on them, um, uh, you know, and, and between any pairs. Okay? And then when you're all done, you shine a different laser beam. And when the atom shines, that's the 
that's a readout of one, and the average stays dark, that's a readout of zero. Uh, so that's how you run, you run a, a typical computation uh, in this system. Now, because um, the, uh, you can actually take arbitrary pairs, your qubits are all, all connected. And this is a very important architectural advantage, is when you try to take an algorithm, the algorithm typically has a structure. And if your hardware matches that structure, then you can, you can actually run that algorithm very well. But if the hardware's architecture connectivity is different than the algorithm's connectivity, then you have a hard time translating. You have to, have to compile into much more complex circuits. Um, so when you're doing algorithm development in the early days, um, having an auto connected uh, quantum computer is actually extremely, extremely helpful uh, in, in running these algorithms. I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of how, we're, how we're seeing this. Um, so um, in order, this is actually some work that was done just as we're spinning out IQ, is how do we actually then take a user who is thinking about quantum algorithms, where, whether it's quantum free transform, uh, which is an example, or, or any other quantum simulation, whatever algorithm you're interested in, and turn it into, into hardware. Um, just like when you program your, your computer in, in Python, you, you think very logically, right? You see, this is how the information flow. This is how I want to uh, process the information. But then you, you send it down and some magic happens under there and all the trends get flipped and so on. You don't think about how the trends will get flipped to do that. You know, your, your computer processor, architecture, the mapping, the compiler, all the tools do that for you. Right? So, so we actually program at a very high level um, and all of the low level uh, Control is actually a bit rapid. Uh, but there is actually a very similar kind of uh, hierarchy here, too. So you think about, for example, you think about this quantum Fourier transform algorithm where you have five qubits and you have all these controlled um, patient of small angles and so on. And this is how you logically, okay, that's, your, that's my quantum Fourier transform. But how, do I, how does the atom actually go do that? The first step um, is uh, you know, these control phase rotation gates. Um, these are not necessarily naked, my hardware. Okay, so you actually have to, to assemble it. So, so these are kind of the naked gates, which is the XX gates. So now I have to translate all of these control rotation angles uh, gates to an XX gate plus a bunch of single I have to translate that. Um, and then um, this XX gate in our system, um, depending on which I am here to pick, um, the control circuit is different. Okay, because the, uh, the motional excitation is all different. So for each pair of gates that you, you want to run, we actually have to design all the control pulses for, for all of that. Um, so that actually is uh, what, what happens at, at the low level. I wanted to say, take the first given and seventh given and, and apply a, a control angle gate. Um, that actually has to get now translated into this laser control pulse. And then there's a, a tool and, and optimization that's needed to do that. Uh, and then, and then once that's all done, then you actually apply that RF signal to the to modulator that will actually execute it. So, if you think about this this sequence, very similar to the classical computers, there's some levels of abstraction that you have to do, and at each of these abstractions, there are optimizations you can do. For. The control pulses can be optimized. The decomposition of circuits into native gates can be optimized, and and all of those make a huge difference in whether your algorithm actually runs or not. In an early stage of computer uh, performance, is your <coughs> challenge. So this is actually some of the latest data from uh, from uh, IMQ's um, latest fulfillment, and you can find this data over here. Um, this was a um, I think a 30, uh, 31 qubit, 32 qubit computer. So there are thirty two ions in this chain, um, and this is uh, now you can actually run single qubit gates on each and every one of them. One single qubit gates. Um, the typical error is measured in PPTD, that parts per 10,000. So when it's two, that means it's 10, two times 10 minus four is the kind of typical error we see in single qubit gates. And single qubit gates is easy. If there are 32 qubits, if you, you know, do single qubit gate on all 32, you measure the, the error, and that's, that's, that's better. What's hard in our architecture, um, in order to get to all to all connectivity, as the number of qubits increase, there is n choose two pairs of two qubit gates here. So in 32, I think that number is 465. So the 465 different pairs of two qubit gates to, to be able to run. Um, so we actually have to create control pulses for each and every one of them. Okay. Um, and you know that gets more challenging as the number of qubits grow, but it's only an n square problem. It's not an exponential problem like that. So it could be done. 
We've done it for 11 qubits, we've done it for 15, we've done it for 22, um, and now we're doing it for, for something a little longer. Uh, and you can see that uh, you know, this is all pairwise in Kaggle uh, in gate, and then we look at the errors. Um, you can see that the um, the errors are, in this case, measured in this is set to the three. Sorry. Um, yeah, this is kind of two. It's ten to the minus one. It's ten to the minus three, I think, or T B T P. Um, so I think here uh, we are typically in the about fifty parts per ten thousand, which is about a half a half a percent error, is where this this major population is. But we do we do see some um, outliers that actually have higher errors that we have to uh, still have to figure out what's going on and optimize. So in this system, what we have been able to do is we add more qubits. Um, and then we actually improve the gates at the same time because uh, adding qubits and, and improving the gates are two relatively <coughs> Remember, the qubits actually don't degrade as you add them because they're they're very nice qubits. Um, and the gates get better as your control technique gets better. So if you can continue to improve your control technique as you add your qubits, you can actually build larger computers that continue to work better. Um, and the question is, you know, can we do this until we get to a point where we can run big enough circuits? That are very hard to simulate classically. So that's kind of the, the, the name of the game. I think we're we're very far home compared to the five qubit system we built uh, maybe five or six years ago. Um, to about I think we're we're at like thirty five or something. Uh, so we can actually continue to push uh, in that direction. Um, I mentioned about this uh, connectivity issue. Um, so this is uh, some very early work. Uh, done in collaboration between Novo uh, and uh, Margaret Martinozzi. She's actually a computer architect. Um, at Princeton, um, and she's been interested in like uh, quantum computing architectures for some time. Um, and here, um, you know, they took a, a very typical approach of, of benchmarking of uh, and a processor's uh, performance uh, based on algorithms. Okay, so um, these are um, you know there there were IBM machines and Bugatti machines that they had access to. Again, this is probably you know five or six years old now. Uh, back then, they didn't have IQ system commercially, so they actually collaborated with Nobert, uh, who had a five qubit system operating in the uh, University of Maryland lab. Um, and they ran these different algorithms. It, it really doesn't matter what they are, but DB4 is like for the Bazaroni algorithm, four qubits, six qubits, and eight qubits. HS is what's called a hidden shift. It's a different algorithm that has two and four, six qubits. Um, Toffoli gates, that's control control knot, which has to be decomposed into a bunch of two qubit gates. Threatening gates, or gates, parent gates, these are all different types of multi qubit gates. Implementation, quantum grid transform, and error, just adding numeric. So, this is uh, the, the foundation of digital computers, is adding numbers, but that's very important for, say, the core algorithm. All right, so these are all different kind of algorithms. Um, and here, you know, if you look at uh, you know, this BB, uh, any algorithms with more than five, we don't have data points for IM because they only had five qubits. Uh, so let's actually ignore them now. Um, and if you to see this all um, and you see this HS2 and QFT. HS2 is some more complicated algorithm, but that only works on two qubits. Okay, the two qubit version. You can see that most of the, of the processors have good uh, success rate because it's only two. If you have two qubits that are connected, you can actually run this algorithm. And in any system, you can pick out two where it does that. I is a little bit better because at least compared to these processors, the algorithm was a little bit better. Um, and this QFT, quantum Fourier transform, it turns out that you can effectively map a quantum Fourier transform to a um, nearest neighbor only. And if you have uh, qubit uh, with only nearest neighbor uh, two qubit gates, you can run QFT factor. And therefore, this QFT runs pretty well on, on many of these architectures that every qubit is connected to their or more. But if you look at all the other algorithms, um, you can see that the, the limited connectivity, the performance starts to, to degrade because limited connectivity means you have to translate a circuit with some number of two qubit gates. If there is no direct connection, I have to translate into many, many small gates. And all of these gates are faulty. So once the number of each two qubit gates blow up because you don't have good connectivity, the performance actually degrades. Okay? Uh, so you can see that in all of these algorithms, uh, the trapped ion stays pretty high. Because you're taking advantage of this architectural uh, advances. Okay, so so I think uh, over time, when your final if your end goal is to make a, a quantum computer that can actually run useful algorithm, 
um, and if you want to build a general purpose quantum computer that can do multiple algorithms, then you really have to think about uh, this connectivity and architecture issues. All right, I know I've like way long of time. <laughs> um, so let me actually make a very brief comment about this, um, and then uh, maybe I'll skip a lot of the details and move to the next section. Um, so you know, when you think about quantum errors, um, there are two different types of errors. And I, I told you our qubits are very coherent. Sometimes the qubit actually self degrades by you know, interacting with uh, uncontrolled degrees of freedom in the environment. And that, that's really um, kind of dephasing noise or, or decoherent noise. Um, that type of noise is called incoherent because it really, you take a quantum state and it goes into a mixed state very quickly. It, it, it's really, it's really different. It goes to, to a mixed, uh, mixed density of matrix, mixed states, density matrix. Um, then there are coherent errors. The coherent errors are, I'm, I'm trying to do a pi over two gate. So I'm going to take this qubit and rotate it. But because of imperfection, I rotate it a little bit more than I want. Now, if I don't know that I do a lot, then I'm not keeping track of how much it's over or over and under it. Then it eventually turns into looks like a random noise. But the origin is different. If you, in principle, can keep track of it, then you actually haven't lost it. Meaning your qubit hasn't spontaneously degraded by intrinsic interaction with a uh, large degree of freedom of track. It's really controlled errors. Okay? And those are, we call them uh, coherent errors. And they're described by uh, different, um, different mathematical tools. Yeah, let me see if I can get to uh, a slide. Oh, uh, actually, not this one. Yeah. So um, if you have an incoherent error, you actually have to do a operation, it's called the, uh, the pass operators, uh, where you actually um, take a mixed, it, it, it turns into a mixed density of states. Uh, where um, with some probability kappa, you replace the density matrix something else, and with probability the one minus kappa, you keep it. Okay. Meaning you, you really start to mix in um, randomly um, this random states, and you really don't have control over it. Uh, whereas uh, if you actually have a um, coherent error, um, if this coherent error, uh, you, you actually take the density operator and you propagate a little bit more with this error. Meaning you're doing still doing a coherent operation. Now the, the nice thing about this is sometimes you, you can actually figure out how to undo it. Whereas this one, the 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 the, the incoherent errors, you don't have a way to undo it because it, it's already it's already the state has already collapsed. Okay. Um so um, once you have once the state has collapsed, <laughs> your only way to recover from it is to really use quantum error correction, which has a huge error. Okay. But if you're limited by control errors, then you can actually come up with very clever ways to, to cancel those errors, either um, by uh, each, at each gate level or by, at each circuit level. <laughs> yeah, and then you can, you can actually do a, a whole lot better. So uh, I think one of the really interesting uh, progress that I've seen in the last uh, three or four years um, is, is how we can do that. So this is actually a, a pretty good uh, summary of how it works. So this unitarity means the nature of your, your error is unitary or not. Okay, so when unitarity is one, this is all coherent error, meaning your, it's all controlled error, you're overdoing or underdoing, or something is just not right in your control, but your quantum system has evolved to a pure state based on that miscalibrated process. And okay, that's unitary error. This uh, is uh, completely non unitary meaning this is a dissipative error. Your, your state has really collapsed. There's nothing I can do about it. And then here we look at um, uh, what happens uh, to a uh, to a circuit. And here we took some uh, error correcting circuit as an example, uh, or or, or Cannon's team and that. Um, so uh, when you're when you're completely incoherent, um, then um, there's nothing you can do. You have to use error correction, and that error correction circuit actually has some circuit level errors. When you have uh, coherent errors, and if you don't do this up properly, then in coherent errors, the errors can add up. Meaning, if you keep over rotating, think about you're, you're just rotating, right? Let's say you rotate over rotated by 1%, and then you over it by another 1%, and so on. Then, then the percentage of over, over rotation adds up. But at the end of the day, the error you have to do an absolute value square. So actually, the, the errors can accumulate in ways that are much more detrimental than poor, 
But if you create the circuit in a more clever way, you can also make that circuit level error go completely to zero. Now, the, the example is, let's say I'm doing an X gate, which means I'm going to take my zero state and turn it into one, and one state to, to zero, okay? And let's say my error is like over-rotation. So every time I rotate, I, I, I over-rotate by one percent. Now, it turns out that if you have an X gate, you also have a minus X gate or X dagger. And, and mathematically, they're exactly the same. Okay? So if you do X, 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 and then all the errors accumulate. But if you replace every other X with an X dagger, which has exactly the same physical effect, and do X, X dagger, X, X dagger, then this control errors, because you're rotating back and forth and back and forth, this over rotation just cancels out. Right? Uh, and this type of uh, approach um, is everywhere. Uh, we, in, in so many of these errors, whether this is a single simple uh, with over rotation of a single cubic case, two cubic case, um, cross dog control cross dog errors, we've come up with ways to, to manage this and mitigate all these errors um, so that uh, you know, these control errors are actually <laughs> cancel out. If we can actually do that optimally, um, then the, the circuit error can really go down in ways that in, in infrared energy. Okay. Um, so this actually is a, a very important theme that I think people have come out realize in the last few years. Um, in the early days, the experimentalists couldn't tell you the theorists what the errors are, right? The, the errors in superconducting qubits and atomic qubits are all very different. Um, so the theorists assume that it's the worst case, the, 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 the depolarizing error. Um, and then the only way to, to resolve that is error correction. And, and the theory of error correction has come up and beautiful and all that. Um, but I think once you start to realize what the nature of your error is, depending on the nature, there are ways you can actually compensate for it before you apply error. Um, and if you look at classical information processing systems, this type of approach is actually very, very prevalent everywhere. Like in your cell phones or optical communication systems, when you have systematic errors, you do not apply error. You have to figure out how to compensate for it. Like um, an optical communication, you, you send these short pulses, right, go down through the fiber. In order to create a really short pulse, you need a lot of different spectrum, different colors have to, have to really create this short pulse. When they propagate down the fiber, they're dispersion, meaning different colors propagate at different speeds. So this pulse will broaden. And if you have two time slots, these short pulses, as they propagate, they broaden and they overlap. So you can't really start to tell anything. But that dispersion is a chart that is very predictable. You don't do error correction on it. You do dispersion compensation and flash it back. But you don't do it. And then you can recover most of the errors. Right? So that's what you do. And only at the very end, people throw in forward error correction to improve your optical communication. So this is actually a very standard thing. Right? If you understand the nature of your error, you can usually fix most of it as long as they are systematic. And then only on the remaining non systematic errors, you, you apply this very extensive error correction. So I think uh, the state of the art where, where we are in terms of ionic research is we're finding out that many, many of these errors that we're seeing are not intrinsic. It's the qubits that you don't naturally deep with your arms. So they are all controller, pretty much. Therefore, we have a lot of room to create a, a very um, intelligent error mitigation techniques to reduce those errors at the circuit level before you actually have to apply error correction. Now, if you have to apply an error correction, design the error correction in a way um, that the effective error of the error correction circuit is a lot better um, than when we're looking for it. Okay, so those are some of the, the really interesting uh, themes um, that is going on at, um, in, in the error mitigation and error correction techniques. All right. Um, so um, I'll, I'll basically, we only have five minutes, so let me run this through. Um, so some of the things that we have done in the last years, I think this is what uh, Dave indicated in the early days, you know, this is how um, an ion quantum computer experiment looked like uh, in, in Chris's lab in 2016, before we started. And, you know, Chris used to say, yeah, you know, each and every one of the developments is not that hard. So you got to have hundreds of these things all work at the same time. And that's really hard, right? It's like juggling a, a lot of balls in the air until everything is in the air and you're in, you're in the mood and then you can collect data. Um, and it typically requires, you know, students and postdocs that's in the lab and tweak it all the time, as Dave said, uh, fix it just before they break. Um, and then uh, we uh, what, I, uh, what we decided when we started this IR uh, uh, project uh, in 2016 
is to let's just break this down. Let's break the system down into different subsystems. And one of them is like vacuum chamber and all the all the laser beams that have to be aligned to it. Um, the other is a, uh, a laser that runs all the gates. This is an illumination module that brings in all these tightly focused laser beams. Um, the CW laser systems, we actually work with AOSense to, to build a very um, very compact laser system. Um, and then, you know, Ion Traps has worked with Sandia, who does a fantastic pattern kind of building, and then um, control software. So we, we just break this down, in, uh, down into subsystems. And what's fascinating is, uh, you know, in a trap diode quantum computer, all quantum computing, no matter if it has hundreds of qubits, the quantum computing actually happens in less than one millimeter space. And all these boxes that we build, it's controls, right? There's so much room for this to eventually come down to something so small. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for, for engineering uh, to happen. So this is what the, what the system uh, looks like. This, this system now, uh, it's moved down to Duke, uh, and it's actually serving dozens and dozens, dozens of collaboration and, and publishing papers for people who want to implement quantum, uh, quantum algorithms. And certainly, we have much better versions and higher capacity versions of this um, now available through our technology at IQ. So it's, it's a vacuum chamber, right? Inside, there's a little trap. Uh, in, on the trap, there are these atoms. Uh, we actually have these RF cables that are you know, creating all of these control pulses. So we program through a uh, completely programmable digital RF. So um, you know, these days there's this RF SOC, it's an FPGA with RF, um, all fully programmable RF built in. We were one of the first uh, uh, scientists to actually adopt that. As soon as it came on the market, we, we bubbled up and we started to go troll us around that. At the end of the day, you know, it can be boxed up like this. Uh, but usually, you know, when you think about an optical system like this, um, you know, they, they work. You can actually make them work. It's extremely flexible to build them. But boy, they are hard to maintain. Every day or two, we have to come in and tweak it. Twice a year when the air conditioning comes up, it's summer. You know, everything goes out of alignment. It takes about three days to rebrick everything. Um, and that's what doesn't allow you to turn into a more commercial system. So. Um, one of my colleagues, Dana Anderson at uh, C. Foley, he said, if you know exactly what you want, you can make it really well. Um, so this is like a Lego piece, meaning we have all these components from which you can build anything you want, all the flexibility, but every degree of freedom that gives you the flexibility is a source of instability, right? But at the end of the day, this is a function. You, you almost never touch it once it's built. So let's think about what you want to build. And then we actually now started to create um, kind of an optical design on, a, uh, on an optical capsule, convert that into a mechanical capsule. We can actually now position all of these, uh, these are all off the shelf um, uh, kinematic mounts. We can actually position them on the substrate within like 20 microns of accuracy using dolphins. Um, so we actually designed that. And then uh, the temperature uh, and everything is very low. Um, and then we actually uh, water cool the base so the temperature doesn't change and we box it up. And this thing we haven't really tweaked in like three years. Right? You, you just, even the fiber coupling is so stable. Just never... So the, the, the key question is, you know, how do we have to be, think about your optics um, and the optical systems differently uh, to, to um, kind of get rid of these pain points? Because once you get rid of pain points, then you can actually move on to the higher levels. Of, okay. Uh, so, you know, these types of, and then of course, when things get more complicated, you have to have like a, 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 a software control or feedback, software operation, and so on. But once all of that is in engineered in, you don't worry about these. Now you can talk about the other um, Another is this vacuum chamber. Just because these two vacuum chambers are very painful to make, um, and, you know, they, the material is careful, you have to bake it for months. Um, during the bake of the cracks. So it, it takes many months and a lot of artwork to make this vacuum chamber work. Um, but you know, I, I was wondering, can we actually take this vacuum chamber and turn it into more packaging? Um, so we work with Quanta uh, and say, okay, at the end of the day, you have your ions are here in this little tiny bottom. You need a trap, you need a source. That's all that needs to be in a vacuum. The reason that these vacuum chambers are so big is in order to get to this kind of vacuum, the 10 minus 11 or better. Um, you have to use complex lenses that has this metallic gasket and big screws, right? So that's what makes the thing big. Um, but we can actually think about uh, a ceramic package and then just enclosing the vacuum right on top of it. Now, in order to do that, 
uh, we can't really put a vacuum gauge, commercial vacuum gauge in, and it's really can't really put a, a big commercial vacuum pump on it. Um, so what we did was we worked with Quanta to create a big vacuum chamber that sits at 10 plus 10, and then it actually seals the vacuum chamber inside this. Okay. Um, and then once it's sealed, I'll, I'll pull it out, and then they can put it in. Um, and then we can put it into a fire set, or we can actually uh, we actually figure out sort of little. They figured out how to put a little ion pump in it. Um, that is uh, <laughs> you know, a two-inch hole and one-inch circular thing. So now this is my vacuum chamber, and uh, surprisingly enough, we can get down to one times mass, but minus eleven with that tiny little vacuum chamber. And now my experiment looks like this: instead of like a vac big vacuum chamber and all the optics around it, now that's my vacuum chamber. And my optics is all around it, that's the best, right? So now, now the next step is, okay, can I actually collapse all the optics around it? Um, and so now we, we came up with a way, bring all of these different colors in a single photonic uh, crystal fiber. We reduced the number of degrees of freedom. Again, still this is pretty much all built with uh, off-the-shelf components. But now all of that optics is collapsed into like a square foot of volume around that vacuum. <laughs> And, and now we're thinking about how to take the rest of the more complicated optics and continue to collapse them. Um, and now the experiment kind of looks like this, right? It's a, it's a small thing that you can literally lift it up um, that used to take a whole optical table full of stuff that's very unstable to do. Um, so I think when, when you think about the, the challenges and look at it from a system perspective, there are many, many different uh, ideas you can bring in to, to the problem differently. Um, and I think if we continue to push this, and uh, yeah, we need we need a little bit better vacuum than what, what we have. We, we wish we had like a 10 minus 15 and 14 vacuum. We only have 10 minus 11. Um, but if we can do that, then I think we can eventually really kind of put all of the quantum computing components uh, into more of a smaller box. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the, the, just the, the evolution in the last uh, less than 10 years, we went from a, a whole laboratory uh, to something on that order. Um, that's actually a, a system I built in my uh, in my lab uh, around the fire set. Now, it turns out that if we use a small uh, slow cycle fire set and, and take that vacuum chamber and pull it down to less than 10 Kelvin, then these ions that are trapped can stay there for weeks because the, there's no collision. Um, everything is uh, starting to come out. And it's no different than the solid cycle at that point. The trap is iron, they last for weeks. Okay. Um, and then, you know, of course, we're, we're starting to collapse all the optics around it. Um, and I think eventually some of the real exciting uh, progress in the last few years is people are starting to now, uh, you know, integrate these uh, optical waveguides so that uh, these beam deliveries can actually now come onto the chip. Um, and then this is a demonstration from Linka Labs where they pipe all the lasers that are needed to track an ion, and then they have these, uh, you know, these Grading couplers that bring it out of the, out of the plane, so you can actually bring, deliver all of the beams trapped with iron over here. Okay, so I think uh, you know it's it's actually quite conceivable that over some time scale, a trapped iron experiment, which started from something like this, can eventually turn into something that's much more compact. And I think a lot of the innovation and technology and and assembly, um, kind of new ways of looking at it, uh, will be helpful uh, in in bringing us there. All right, so. Uh, let me put my my last uh, technical slide up. Uh, so you know how do we? You know, what, what is the real uh, exciting frontier for quantum computing? If we look at the the gate error versus qubit number, yeah, with two qubit people can do pretty good gates. Uh, with with uh, with a pretty bad operation error, people can get the very long qubit number. We're kind of confined in this little corner, and and that corner is actually not super interesting because everything in that corner can be calculated simulated very fast. Okay, so we really have to kind of push the hardware up in that corner, meaning more qubits, better fidelity. Okay, and I think, you know, things like uh, error mitigation technique and things like that uh, can definitely help you um, get to that point. And that's where a lot of the, the development effort is. Um, and then we have to identify problems that are up there that can't be solved practically. And then think about kind of software development so that these uh, the improving hardware and improving software can actually meet somewhere in the middle. And then I think that will be a very, very exciting point. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank a lot of my collaborators over, over the years. I would actually especially like to uh, mention uh, the colleague Se Wazam. He actually um, was a graduate student here. He was a year ahead of me. Um, 
working in what's the first group down in the basement of physics, <laughs> where we spent a lot of time just figuring out how to wire the fire set together, things like that. Um, he also did a pioneering work in uh, single um, superconducting nanotubes, which is ubiquitous everywhere. Um, he had a break to run half away uh, last month, um, but I'd like to recognize his contribution to the field uh, um, and the legacy he has uh, built the uh, Stanford community as well. Um, now, this is uh, us at uh, the Quantum Center. Uh, we actually have, uh, I, I don't know if you know this person, um, this person is Robert Haldemang. Um, and Robert is, um, if, if you're working in quantum aeroprotocol, there is a class of code called CSS code, Calibrator Team. He's the Calibrator of Calibrator Team, um, one of the pioneers in quantum aeroprotocol. But he's actually, actually had a much bigger impact on all of our lives. He used a cell phone. Um, he actually invented the uh, space time code that's used in 4G and beyond. So um, every time you pick up your phone, uh, we're using inventions from him, but he's also happens to be a quantum uh, algorithm expert. Uh, then, uh, the point is that we have people um, all the way from doing you know, control all the way up to algorithms to trying to see if we can build up this vertical integration to see uh, quantum computer can be made something useful. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at IMP. All right, that, I know I went over time, but happy to take any questions. So, yeah, I think we can have a few questions. Yeah. But just so you know, the, 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 the tradition here is that at least the student should ask uh, the first question before the faculty debate. So, I don't know. So, a new question. You mentioned that experience is speaking. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the when you, when you think about uh, the quantum oscillator, yeah. Uh, that has X and P and they're front together. Um, so they're they're creating breathing in front of the first two times. All the action you get with you very wide flashes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um no. So um so obviously when you go to this kind of action. That's the commercial vacuum gauge is an ion gauge. Uh, if you can read a pressure from an ion gauge or pressure, we always operate in the beginning of our ion gauge. So we actually created uh, on a scrap, we created this, this uh, double potential and tried to grab an ion here and make the very really low. So if there's any collision with a background gas, it will jump over. But 50% has to be up there and then it will come back. Okay, so we start to monitor this jumping rate. Um, and in that room temperature small chamber, uh, based on that jumping rate, we're getting about one time per minute flooded. Now, when you get down to the trial, uh, we can actually start from bad vacuum and look at that jumping rate a little up and up. And at some point, it doesn't. Looking at one event per day after that, okay. <laughs> I should do this one. Um, so, um, I think the expectation is the expert is really low. Um, the anecdote is we can create multiple chains and those things. Usually, the laser goes on a walk. And, and this happens with like eight hours, eight to ten hours. The people added to the top of the meters are kind of starting to signal qubit rates and maybe also to qubit rates. How do you see like the scaling potential? Because for ion chains, you're kind of limited at 30 meters. Like, you can, yeah. So I listen to me. So you think that's like sure. a uh, so I mean, I, actually, there's another talk I'm giving tomorrow, which will be much more on scaling architectures and, and algorithms. Um, so if you're interested, I think right here is to see that seminar. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, I think I think the, the progress in neutral lab communities is very, very exciting. It, um, actually, when when I I first started a quantum computing program in 2010, um, I led uh, our Iron Chef team. I was the, the lead guy. I actually had my first company. And I worked with uh, Mark Sapman, who was working on Intralato. Uh, and I worked with him for six years on that project, trying to come up with some later techniques. Now, of course, um, the it was it was a struggle because it was very difficult to get the 
uh, report gates that need to go up. Uh, and you know, that project can be the plan sustained. Now, I think people have figured out what the source of that problem is. Scaling was always the advantage. Um, and then you know, I think I think the the we, we also have much more smarter people than me designing the optical controllers with uh dipole straps and so on. So I think the, the field has seen a uh, huge progress. I think it's very, very exciting. Um I think the um so the question is you know, how do you compare these, right? How do you compare superconducting tubing to ion trap tubing to neutral atom to the um and you know if you all the physicists are going to always come and play the my system the best. I'm sure I'm ready to do all of that. But at the end of the day, if we build a quantum computer, we have to be able to do installation. Otherwise, nobody wins, right? Um, so I think at the end of the day, um, we have to really, right now, the, the industry is really kind of mostly dominated by people who build the system. And then they all try to figure out how to tell the story that they're better. And, that, and there's some truth in all of those. But at the end of the day, it will have to be the users, the user community who says, this is the problem I have to solve. What is the best system to run this to get the kiddos? Um, and I think that uh, balance of the vendor and the, and the user voice is very important because then we're going to eventually focus on the right problem that we should focus on. And you know, the hardware vendors will try to make sure that they have a system that can do that well. Um, and then the software vendors can like, innovate how to optimally so at the end of the day, I think um, all these systems have, have different advantages and vision for how they scale. Um, the question is, how do you measure that from an impactful application point of view? Uh, when that impactful application is yet to be identified. But that's a challenge, but that's a huge opportunity. If you can if you can crack that, you can beat them all with <laughs> open AI, right? So I think that that's where the excitement and, and, uh, and the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think that like, you sort of alluded to this when you kind of mentioned the work um, on actually trying to integrate more things, modularizing more things, and kind of just isolating different systems. Um, I guess I, I wanted to kind of explore that a little further and just get your thoughts on where, where you think kind of the human side of working on, on quantum systems is going kind of from like the, I don't know, maybe like the original AMO like vibe of, of kind of small teams of grad students trying to improve the system a little faster than it degrades um, to I think one where there are more and more like subsystems that all are well engineered but need people to engineer them well, where what will working on this look like? Yeah, mm. that, that's a great question. Um, you know, um, I think it's uh, the question is what are we trying to accomplish, right? Um, I think in the typical AMO lab, and I was in the same way with my semiconductor research when I was in school, we want to discover a demonstration condition. And what you do is whatever it takes, or we don't know how to do it, therefore we have to provide it. And, um, you know, if we can get kind of get it to work, because we have other things that we do. But at the end of the day, you're adding all these other Right, you need a laser, you need a vacuum, you need a delivery system, you need a controller, you need a programming, you actually have to need all of that, right? Um, but um, I think in the in the research phase, we want that to be very flexible because you're trying to do things that are very not, not very well defined. And then you have a goal, but you don't know how to do it, and therefore we improvise, right? I remember when I was in grad school and I walked into Mark's office and said, Mark, I need to detect symbol with us, and he told me how to use APDs and, and so on. <laughs> The graphic contraption to do it, and, and these are, this is what you need, right? So I think when you're in an AMO physics lab, the goal is to accomplish a result, and, and you improvise. So you don't have a lot of, you don't want to spend all of your time. When you're moving into quantum computing, it's different. Now we know how to do some of those things, and, and the protocols now now how do you scale? How do you make it more reliable? How do you actually develop the calibration process? How do you actually execute algorithms on it? Then the underlying technology has to be very stable. Now you have a different perspective, right? And then you go back and say, okay, what is my students like struggling with? What's making their life just fall? And then you go to the different hat on and say, can I do this very different? Can I think of it very differently? And it's okay if I invest some time and effort, but all of these things were done by grad students, right? Now, of course, we do it at scale company today. All of these original ideas came from students. Yeah, instead of like, you know, assembling 
ping on the table, I'm going to spend a little more time on the cat, set it up with nice machine count into that assembly. Right? And, and it's, it's the same kind of time, it's just the focus and the goal of what you accomplish is there. But once you have it under your belt, and then now running the quantum computer and algorithm becomes much more of an operation problem. But without fixing that problem, it can be. So it, it depends on the goal. Um, and of course, these are starting to be more of a engineering students are more excited about these things. <laughs> uh, so in one of your early slides, you uh, claimed that T2 had no inherent limit. There was no inherent limit to defacing errors of a hyperfine state. Why does uh, the inherent line width of the transition not limit your defacing errors? T2 wouldn't be infinity, but it would be maybe several hours. Or so. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, and that, again, is, is kind of the, the, the 10,000 euro is the line. Okay, so, sure. so if you, and, and that's why, you know, we, we have to decide how we can do that time, absolute frequency limits. That is the most stable physical system that the physicists were able to come up with in the 70s. That's why we pick that as a standard. Okay, so yeah, there, there are inherent errors. Okay? And I think today there are better blocks, than optical blocks and so on. And once we change it to optical blocks, and yeah, I think we can start to not be true anymore, but there won't be more, more stable standards. Um, but I, I think based on where we are today, it probably is good to guess. So, so I think that's a good point to end kind of the official like session, but uh, I think Jim's will be around a little bit so people have more questions. You can have them. Thank you.